If you bring up people to an idea that women are the property of men, then don't be surprised if an element of those people start doing what Boko Haram did and kidnap young girls. And likewise, if you say that Islam is in fundamental hostility with the West, don't be surprised if you end up with a certain number of those people saying, well, in that case, we should go and fight them. Well, it's what the Labour Party have been waiting for and working for all these years. Tony Blair breathed new life into the UK's Labour Party in 1997 when he led them to victory over the Conservatives who had been in power for 18 years. His was a different kind of Labour Party. New Labour, they called it. Progressive and yet pro-business. As the 20th century drew to a close, the United Kingdom saw a period of great economic growth and Blair received much of the credit. He was dashing and he was popular at home and abroad. But then, in the wake of 9-11, Blair chose to become a wartime leader. He aligned himself with U.S. President George Bush. Thank you all. And he led the charge to send British troops into wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, in part because of fears of terrorist groups getting their hands on radiological weapons. But on July 7, 2005, much less sophisticated bombs exploded across London, and it became clear that the threat was changing. The people who carried out these bloody attacks were young and had actually grown up in the United Kingdom. Whatever they do, it is our determination that they will never succeed in destroying what we hold dear in this country. Prime Minister Blair then created a new counter-terrorism program called PREVENT, which aimed to halt the spread of extremist ideology by mentoring at-risk youth. The strategy alienated many of the people it was meant to engage, and Blair's own domestic intelligence chief characterized the project as a failure. Since leaving office in 2007, Blair has been dogged by his former constituents over his role in the Iraq War. The man is a war criminal! And by people who saw his selection as Mideast peace envoy an odd choice. Now Mr. Blair has come to this Washington think tank to kick off a commission on countering violent extremism. Would you please, with your warm applause, welcome Prime Minister Tony Blair. Together with his co-chair, former director of the CIA and Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta, they plan to provide whoever wins the 2016 election with advice on how to combat what they see as an existential threat. The threat of violent extremism is growing, casting its shadow over ever larger parts of the globe. We sat down with Mr. Blair for a brief chat about just what this new commission is trying to achieve. Mr. Blair, thanks for joining us. Can you talk to us a bit about this Countering Violent Extremism initiative that you're co-chairing here at CSIS? Yeah, we, we've got the possibility of major and the reality of major terrorist attacks in our own societies. We've got a large part of the world now that's convulsed by this uh, extremism. And, you know, we've got many years since 9-11 and experience in dealing with it. But I think now is the right moment to say, right, what is a comprehensive strategy? You're going to have a new president coming in the U.S., got new leadership, many parts of Europe. What is the right combination of elements that give us a chance of defeating this? And we will focus both on the military capability to defeat the, this threat on the ground, but also the what I think is a the bigger and more difficult question, which is the ideology, the extremist ideology, which gives rise to the, the, the violent jihadism. The commission seems to have a, a decidedly American slant in terms of you know, wanting to prepare a policy paper for the next American president. But in, in 2014, the FBI's National Domestic Threat Assessment ranked uh, so-called sovereign citizens, white supremacists, black separatists, environmental radicals, pro-abortion groups as uh, the biggest domestic threats. Is this group going to deal with some of those extremists, or is this ultimately about Islam? It, it, it's ultimately about the, the violent extremism you see around the world, uh, which is a battle about Islam, within Islam, but where we have, by the way, you know, huge allies within Islam to conduct this fight. And, you know, it's true that you can look at different activities of individual groups or individual incidents, but this is a global problem and this is the one we have to, to tackle. And for a country like America, I mean, after all, you had 9-11, you had the, the, um, the tragic events of San Bernardino a short while ago. I mean, I think your security people, as ours would back 
on our side of the water would say that this is the single biggest threat we, we face. Now, countering violent extremism, or CVE as it's called, is, is, it, is, it, is trending right now. It's become almost kind of a fad in Washington. And I wonder how you see this program as different from other existing programs. I think we will be different in two respects. The first is there isn't a huge amount of analysis on what is the right way to put together a force capability that can move quickly to snuff out this jihadist threat wherever it originates. So that's one issue. And the other issue, which is in a way more controversial, is that I think the issue is not just violent extremism, it is extremism. In other words, I think if, if you bring up people to an idea that women are the property of men, then don't be surprised if an element of those people start doing what Boko Haram did and kidnap young girls. And likewise, if you say that Islam is in fundamental hostility with the West, don't be surprised if you end up with a certain number of those people saying, well, in that case, we should go and fight them. So it's dealing with the ideology of extremism and not just the violence that I think is important and will somewhat mark out the, the work of this commission. So you, you talk about a, a focus on extremism and this is something that people have been looking at for a long time. The best social scientists, the best researchers have been trying to figure out the, the jump from radical, uh, a radical political ideology to violent extremism. I wonder what advances this group might be able to make in that front and, and uh, if you're hoping to be able to provide some advice for parents who are trying to figure out whether or not their son or daughter is on the verge of taking this from... Uh, a newfound interest in uh, their religion or something that they're actually going to go act on? I think we will look at some of the basic counter-radicalization measures, but there are lots of people doing that, frankly, and working out what are the right ways if you're, you know, to prevent self-radicalization, you know, what are the right ways to spot if, if young people are, are going towards a particular view that might be dangerous. I think we will, though, focus also on things like the education system as a whole. Around the world today, there are millions and millions of young people who are educated to a view of the world that we would frankly be pretty shocked by, that is inimical to values of pluralism and tolerance, and that has at its heart a narrow view of, of religion to the exclusion of virtually everything else. Now, I, I personally believe that it's one of the things the Commission will test that when those millions of young people are educated in that way, that is, you are creating the soil in which the extremism breeds because it's, you know, th this is not equipping young people for the modern world. It's, it's in a way polluting their mind to a view of the world that is really incompatible with modern coexistence. So do you see education at, at the root of this? Yes, and one of the things I, I, I have been working on is whether you need a what I call a kind of global commitment on education. Over the last 20 years, we've come to a very important global principle. You know, countries used to say, look, what we do within our own borders, that's up to us. If we pollute, that's up to us. And in the environmental uh, arena, we've said, and countries have now agreed, okay, you can't say that's just your problem because it's our problem. If you pollute within your boundaries, that gives us all a problem. I think it's exactly the same with this type of education. And I think we are entitled to say, particularly with countries with whom we have strong relationships, often giving billions and billions of dollars, by the way, we're entitled to say, look, you can't, you can't educate your young people to this closed-minded view of the world. You've got to reform your system and promote religious tolerance and root out religious prejudice. If you don't do that, it's not your problem, it's our problem. Because these people are coming across from your borders and they're joining these groups and they're propagating uh, these thoughts, and it's, it's causing this global menace. Speaking of cross-border pollution, if you will, I mean, foreign policy certainly has an impact um, on aff affecting people's ideologies, educated or not. Um, I mean, what, what role do you see foreign policy playing in extremist thought? Well, there'll be lots of debates about, which, again, we should test in the Commission, about the degree to which, for example, our foreign policy has encouraged extremism. These are live debates, of course. Um, but also what our foreign policy should be to build the alliances in order to defeat this extremism. You know, you've got countries affected that are, have traditionally been moderate and tolerant, countries like Indonesia. Um, you know, you've got countries in Central Asia that are avowedly secular, yet they've now got a serious problem. And you have countries in Africa, you know, now I'm afraid many of them, 
whose tradition was one of absolute coexistence between Christians and Muslims and who now find themselves racked by internal division and strife. So I think, yes, we will certainly look at the foreign policy aspects of this. Um, but, you know, truthfully now it is clear this is a global problem and the biggest foreign policy challenge is to get the right alliances to defeat it. Do you say... Mm -hmm. one more and then... Sure, oh, just one more, huh? Okay, I have to think. So just so a question there about you as a former prime minister of the UK, uh, Mr. Panetta, former head of the CIA. Um, those, you know, you are elites and you would appeal to a, a certain sect of people, but also you'd probably be quite divisive in, in terms of others. Does this project focus on the elites, on policymakers, or are we trying to actually engage civil society with your recommendations? We certainly should engage civic society too. Um, but, you know, in the end, this is about policymaking. And by the way, one thing I've learned about this area, there is no uncontroversial way of analysing or discussing it. Mm -hmm. You know, people get have fiercely opposing views. But I'm looking at, I mean, <laughs> I'm looking at how do we give those who are in office, you know, a practical policy guidebook, handbook, to how to deal with this. Because I know if I was in office today, that's what I'd want. And I'd want people who've got experience, but have the, maybe the, you know, the, the, the space to be able to analyze it at one remove from the hot seat, as it were, sure. but who've some experience of the hot seat to, to give some, some guidance. And you know, there's a lot of talk about political elites, but you know, in the end, you elect your leaders and the people elect the leaders, but the leaders have still got to have policies. I don't know whether that makes them elitists or not, but, you know, they've got to have policies. So one of the things that's important is that we give people a proper policy and not simply a headline. Um, I'm told we don't have time to relitigate the Iraq war, uh, but, but, um, but I think it's fair to say that you were, um, you, you vigorously defended the decisions you made during that time. And, and I ask this in relation to CVE. I feel like at the heart of countering violent extremism is an ask. We're asking people with uh, entrenched, uh, hateful ideologies who are willing to kill and die for them to, we're asking those people to take a long, hard look at themselves and perhaps realize the folly of their ways. And I, I wonder how you can do that without having a bit more humility about past decisions you've made and, and the consequences of yeah, those Yeah, sure. Decisions. Look, by the way, I have immense humility about it. Um, it's just that if people ask me whether I honestly believe we would have been in a better place if um, Saddam Hussein was still governing Iraq, particularly when the Arab Spring began, then I would say, no, I don't think we would be in a better place. But that's a debatable issue. And by the way, there's nobody who's in government today including the present occupants of the office who aren't taking decisions that are incredibly controversial. You know, for us, it was intervening in Afghanistan and Iraq. Actually, there's partial intervention in Libya. There's been non-intervention or largely non-intervention in Syria. All of these things are controversial. And the thing is, once you understand that there's no way of having this debate without, you know, you know, some people will say, well, he shouldn't be, you know, he's disqualified or that person shouldn't be speaking. You're just going to have to get over that because the important thing is to realize this threat is growing, it's global, and it's going to take a generation to defeat it. But we won't defeat it unless we have an honest policy debate. And, you know, into that debate goes all the questions to do with post 9-11 and Afghanistan, Iraq, and the war against terror, all of that is in the mix, but so are the, the events of the last few years. And I think what's necessary is to learn the policy of all, the, the lessons of all that period of policy making, so that we try, on the basis of the experience we've now had over these past 15 years, try to get a, what I would call a, a sort of, a more unified centrist policy, which is tough and radical, but still sensible, and tries to build alliances of coexistence rather than those of division. I wish you luck. Yeah, I'll uh, need it. <laughs>